Good morning. One of my favorite topics to study is the field of apologetics or a defense, to make a defense. And this morning we're going to talk about undesigned coincidences. Undesigned coincidences. And uh, before we get into that, just we live in an increasingly skeptical generation. People more, I feel like uh, past 20, 30, 40 years, people have questioned traditional values, people have questioned institutions and all these things. Not all of the things are bad, some of it's good, but a lot of it's bad as well. There's good and bad in both. But we need to be aware that people are highly skeptical. If you grew up in a Christian home, believing in scripture and in Jesus' uh, life, death, and resurrection, that was taken as a given, right? You didn't have to think too hard about believing in that. You just kind of grew up believing it, and uh, you've continued to believe in it. But I want us to imagine if we didn't grow up with that familiarity with scripture or with Jesus. If that was just totally foreign to us, our family wasn't into it, our grandparents weren't into it, it's just not part, it was never part of your daily life or your life at all. And I think that sometimes we forget exactly the shocking things that we are asking people to believe in so much so that they're willing to die for it. Right? <laughs> to believe that a man was resurrected, that he was dead for three days, and he resurrected. Oh, and guess what? He wasn't just a normal human. He was the son of God. Right? Just tell that to someone who's not familiar with scripture, who's not familiar with religion, and realize you're trying to get them to believe in that, to stake their life upon it. What would it take for you, if you didn't grow up in a Christian ha household, what would it take for you to believe that a man walked on water, or that 5,000 people were fed with five loaves of, of bread and two fish. Or that God's son was crucified and in three days later came back to life. Well, how would you feel if someone walked up to you and said that? Hey, last month I saw this guy. He fed 5,000 people with like two orders from Taco Bell. It was crazy, you know? You'd be like, no, you're crazy, right? You'd think they're crazy. What evidence do you have to say that? So again, realize this is, these are the things that we are asking people to believe. And these shocking claims were just as hard to believe then as they are now. Things don't change under the sun, as the preacher tells us in Ecclesiastes. In Acts 17.30, Paul is among a highly intelligent community. It's a highly intelligent society. They were feeling, they were, they were looking for truth, for morality, and they were trying to find it in all these different philosophies. And here Paul is front and center at the... the uh, I don't know what the word is, the capital, right, of this ideological pursuit of morality and knowledge. And Paul is standing before this crowd, and he says, The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Verse 32, now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again about this. You see, they didn't have a different reaction than most people would today. If they don't grow up familiar with scriptures or with Jesus or with religion, they have the same reaction. That's just, that sounds silly, right? That sounds silly that a person was dead for three days and came back to life and that he's going to judge the world. You know, what are you on about? But Paul was not afraid to give people evidence and reason to believe in the resurrection. In 1 Corinthians 15, he's speaking to Christians. <laughs> he's speaking to Christians, and he says, Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers. At one time, he's defending the doctrine of resurrection, and he's defending that Jesus was resurrected, which was hope for our resurrection. He says he appeared to five, more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Why do you think Paul's saying that most of these folks are still alive? Go yeah, go ask them. You go ask them. They're still alive. You can say, what did he say? What was he like? What did he, what did he do? Paul was not afraid or think it was a bad thing to give good reasons and evidence to believe in the resurrection, to believe in Jesus. Um, he, it's not a shameful thing to want or to give good reasons to believe in such fantastic claims. In fact, it is our duty to make this defense. In 1 Peter 3.15, Peter tells us, but in your hearts... Honor Christ the Lord as holy. What does that look like if we honor Christ as holy in our lives? Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. 
yet do it with gentleness and respect. We've got to remember that part too, the gentleness and respect aspect of it. Most secular biblical scholars view the scriptures, and especially the gospels, as being loosely based on true events that were exaggerated and mythologized and developed over time. So in other words, that they believe that Jesus was a failed apocalyptic prophet, that there was a man named Jesus who did claim all these things, but he never claimed to be the son of God. That was added later. He never claimed that he would be resurrected from the dead. That was added later because his disciples just couldn't stand that he was dead. So then they made up this whole story and that continued. And then as time went on, they made up more and more facts about his resurrection and about his appearances. And so what you get is basically mythologized of a reality, you know, kind of like, uh, Homer, right? Maybe there was a real person, but then it's become mythologized into history. That's kind of the secular academic view. And this view has trickled down to colleges, to media, and it's become the default position of those who are unfamiliar with Scripture. I ran into so many people who haven't even cracked open a book, you know, watched one video. That's just their default position because they've heard it one way or the other without even seeking it out, and so they just accept it, right? Because that sounds a lot more normal than what we're asking them to believe. Just like the folks at the Areopagus, it sounds strange. And so today I would like to put forward my favorite evidence for the scriptures being historically reliable and not legend. In other words, that what they say they saw, they saw. What they heard, they heard. And it is a historical account. It's based in eyewitness testimony. These things really happened and they, uh, <laughs> not mythologized, it really happened and they really saw it. And my favorite way to defend this is undesigned coincidences. And this means two records which incidentally provide complementary details that together create a fuller picture of an event which would be unlikely if one was copying from the other or both from the common source. So let me explain that in normal human talk. So example number one, imagine two people witness a bank robbery, okay? And the police are trying to get a detailed event of what happened during this robbery. And so they get these witnesses and, you know, some people will say they're witnesses and they didn't see anything just to try to be a part of the action. So they got to be wary. Okay, some people are going to be lying. Some people are going to be telling the truth. So how you determine that? So imagine you have one witness who says that the thief's shoe was untied during the robbery. And then you get another witness who doesn't say anything about the shoe being untied. But she says, I saw the robber tripping all over the place. That is an undesigned coincidence. Right? They're not saying that for any specific reason. They're just saying what they saw. So with those two witness statements, you can get a picture. Oh, he was tripping because his shoe was untied. And what's most likely is that these two are telling the truth because their stories just happen to corroborate each other. It makes sense together. These unintentional details end up corroborating each other, which means that it is likely both are independently sharing eyewitness testimony. They both saw the events that took place. Here's another example. Imagine you want to throw a surprise party for Gist. And hey, Miss Anne, she says, I heard that Gist loves baklava. It's what he'd really like. For the dessert, for his guest party, make him baklava. So how can you be sure that Gist truly does love baklava? Because you know Miss Anne, sometimes she, she likes to set you up, just give you a hard time a little bit. You know, how do you know? How do you know whether she's mistaken and Gist will hate your party because you made the wrong dessert? You don't want to risk it, right? So you, you go about your day, you're wondering this, and then on a totally separate event, you call Stan because you want a new sign made. And in the conversation, he casually mentions, oh, by the way, I saw the funniest thing yesterday. At a meeting, I, I saw a guest, he was, he was scrolling through his phone and looking at baklava recipes. Okay, by combining the claim made by Ann with the unplanned mention by Stan about guest recipe viewing habits, you can have assurance that Gist truly does love baklava and he won't hate your party or you, right? Because you made the right decision. You put the pieces together. I don't know if he likes baklava, by the way. So this is contrasted. Are we on the same page? Undesigned coincidences. You see these different events that incidentally mentioned that combine to tell one story. This is vastly different from forgeries. And there are a lot of forgeries um, that that have been claimed as scripture and you can look at it and you can see these things because they don't have these undesigned coincidences forgeries tend to avoid loose ends and inconsistencies whereas authentic accounts often contain these unintentional overlaps right if they mention something they, they're sure that their story is straight or like hey by the way i'm saying this remember this i'm saying this so that way it corroborates they don't like loose ends because that makes them seem uh 
Well, Miss Donna was a teacher, right? If you, wh what is suspicious is when students have the exact same answers, right? That's what's suspicious. When it all is perfectly uniform, that's when you get suspicious. Someone's lying, someone's cheating. Whereas if it's undesigned, we see that it's not just, it's this undesigned coincidence is likely that it's a true narrative that is truly seen. False narratives will not leave any ambiguities. They'll be sure to spell out how one detail verifies the other. They won't leave it to you, you're, you careful, carefully studying it. They'll say it for you so you don't even have to think about it. So today we're going to examine five different undesigned coincidences that demonstrate the historical reliability of the scriptures. So the first one is Goliath of, of Gath. In 1 Samuel 17.4, it says, And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. This is the famous story of David and Goliath. And it says that Goliath was from Gath. That's a minor detail. Does that mean anything to any of us? Cool. Goliath is from Gath. I like the alliteration, but that's as far as my interest extends with this. In Numbers 13.32... We go backwards. Again, remember, these, this, is not, this is not 1 Samuel. This is Numbers, different books, right? In Numbers 13, 32, it says, So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land when they had, that they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone to spy out, uh, we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people that we saw in it are of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, the, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim, and we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. So the giant descendants of Anak were seen in Canaan, causing fear among the Israelites. Again, does that mean anything to any of us? Not particularly. So let's go to Joshua, once they start conquering the land of Canaan. It says in 1121, And Joshua came at that time and cut off the Anakim from the hill country, from Hebron, from Debir, from Anab, and from all the hill country of Judah, and from the, all the hill country of Israel, Joshua devoted them to destructions, uh, to destruction with their cities. There was none of the Anakim left in the land of the people of Israel. Stop. Where did Goliath come from then? Right? Where did Goliath come from? Look, only in Gaza, in Gath, in Ashdod, did some remain. Undesigned coincidences in the Old Testament, though often subtle, right? He doesn't spell out, by the way, I know that Joshua says that all of them were killed, but he's, he doesn't spell that out. He just says, Gath, he's from Gath. And then it flows perfectly. He doesn't spell it out, it's there. It's subtle, but it offers significant support for the authenticity and the interconnectedness of biblical narratives. These casual connections reinforce the notion that the scriptures are based in truthful and detailed accounts rather than fabricated stories. That'd be difficult. If you're making up a whole story, right, and collaborating with other people, it'd be very difficult to have those little things like that, right? So second one, Ahithophel's notives, not motives. Now this one is in the same, uh, the same book, but again, these different narratives, different intentions. In 2 Samuel 15.10, this is when David's son betrays him. It says, But Absalom sent secret messengers throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then say, Absalom is king at Hebron. He's trying to take the kingdom for himself from his father. And verse 12, And while Absalom was offering the sacrifices, he sent for Ahithophel, the, Gilead, the Gilonite, David's counselor from the, his city Gilo. And the conspiracy grew strong, and the people with Absalom kept increasing. Now, in those days, the counsel that Ahithophel gave was as if one consulted the word of God. So was all the counsel of Ahithophel esteemed by both David and by Absalom. What would possibly, possibly motivate a wise man such as Ahithophel to betray David? He's smart, so smart. Why would he betray? You know, that makes no sense. It's risky. It's a gamble. Look at 2 Samuel eleven three. 3. Again, we're, we're going backwards. Totally different narrative. And David sent and inquired about the woman, and one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So Bathsheba was the daughter of Eliam. Look at 2 Samuel 23, 34. Again, we're going way forward here. Eliphalet, the son of Asabai of Makkah, Eliam, the son of Ahithophel, got a night. By piecing together these references, we uncover that Bathsheba is the granddaughter of Ahithophel, David's trusted counselor. Ahithophel's betrayal makes sense in light of David's actions against Bathsheba's family. The narrative's coherence emerges from dis disparate texts revealing deeper motivations and connections. 
Again, it's not spelled out. It doesn't write right there, by the way, Ahithophel's granddaughter was Bathsheba. It's just undesigned. It's mentioning totally different things. And then you look at it, examine it, and it tells, ah, oh, this connects. This makes sense. And so you may be saying this is all well and good. Perhaps David did exist. Perhaps there was a tall warrior. But does this do anything to prove that the Gospels are telling the truth about Jesus? So for context, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are four independent accounts of Jesus' life, death, and his resurrection. And they were all written at different times by different authors. Different authors, different times, John being the latest in the 90s AD. So again, which is vastly different uh, from the earlier ones up to 50, 60, 70. So what if we could find undesigned coincidences in the Gospels? Maybe one or two, right? You may, one or two could be explained away, like, oh, just... Happy, you know, just, it's just an accident. But what about like a whole slew of them? By the way, I only had to do, I only did five because I could not do more than that. <laughs> there are way more undesigned coincidences than the, the ones I'm mentioning. So if you have more questions about this, I'm more than happy to share. Third, we're going to look at the sons of thunder, the sons of thunder. In Mark 3:17, this is in the Gospels. It says, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name bon, bon Jonas. I don't know how to say that. That is sons of thunder. So Jesus gives him a nickname. Wouldn't that be so cool for Jesus to give you a nickname? Nonetheless, it'd be Sons of Thunder. Like, that's epic. Like, it'd be so cool. Like, yeah, with the Sons of Thunder. Mark gives us no rationale as to why Jesus names James and John this nickname. Why he calls them Sons of Thunder. It just doesn't. Nothing in there. No insight. No contextual clue. He just calls them Sons of Thunder. So let's go to a different author who wrote at a different time, who's talking about the same things from different witnesses, it says in Luke 9, 53, but the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, who are the sons of thunder, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? I think I understand why Jesus gave them the nickname sons of thunder. You see, we get an insight into their nature, into their personalities based on that totally separate account that Luke gives us. Luke gives us insight into why these brothers got such an explosive nickname. And the key to an undesigned coincidence is the casual nature of the details given, right? Like Luke doesn't try to associate this event with their nicknames. He doesn't write, they called down from fire from heaven and Jesus said, yeah, I rightly called you sons of thunder, right? He doesn't immediately connect that. It's just there, right? <coughs> Completely separate, not designed or not designed, quote unquote, I think it is, but, <laughs> but more than mankind knows. It can only be noticed by careful reading. And then we look at four, Herod's conversation. In Matthew 14, 1, it says, At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus. And he said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. So you may be sitting there wondering, All right, how does Matthew know about a conversation that Herod, this king, had in his own house how does he have any insight into that conversation is he just making stuff up look at luke in luke 8 and verse 3 and it says and joanna the wife of husa herod's household manager and susanna and many others who provided for them out of their means joanna was one of jesus's disciples and her husband guess what was herod's household messenger this explains perfectly how matthew would have known about this conversation and again, Matthew makes no mention about this fact. Matthew doesn't mention that, that uh, Husa is a household manager and is married to Joanna, but Luke does. This lends the likelihood that this is a historical account rather than people just making stuff up for fun. You see, they didn't get together and collaborate. Okay, I'll mention this detail. You mention that detail. They're separated by geography, by time, by different sources, right? And they're saying the same thing, and they corroborate each other. Not intentionally. Again, not intentionally. So what? You may be wondering. Maybe this conversation in Herod's house is historical. That's not hard to believe. What about something like a miracle? That's a lot harder to believe, isn't it? So this is our final one, and it's a bonus one because there's two parts to it. So Jesus feeds the 5,000. In John 6 and verse 5, it says, Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? Why does Jesus ask Philip? Right, he's got 12 of them. <laughs> Why does he specifically look at Philip and say, hey, uh, where can we get something to eat? Well, 
We have no insight from the Gospel of John as to why. But look at Luke. In Luke 9 and verse 10, in his account of this, it says, On their return, the apostles told him all that they had done, and he took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida. But he said to them, You give them something to eat. They said, We have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we are to go and buy food for all of these people. So Luke records that this miraculous feeding took place in Bethsaida. So how is this relevant to our question about why Jesus asked Philip where to get food? Well, go back to John chapter 1, verse 44. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. This miracle took place in Philip's hometown. Philip would be the most logical person to ask, hey, where can we get some food? You grew up around here, right? And again, John doesn't mention where the speeding took place, but he mentions that Jesus asked Philip. Luke doesn't mention that Jesus asked Philip, but he records that it happened in Bethsaida. And so their independent testimony, right, they corroborate each other through this undesigned coincidence. John and Luke corroborate each other's account through these minor, unplanned details. And here's the bonus round. This is one of my favorites for, so, for some reason. It's just so little. It's so little. Mark 6, verse 38, it says, And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. Tells them to sit down on the green grass. Again, you're thinking, so what? <laughs> yeah, I can do that at a park anytime I want. Why is green grass, why is this little detail so significant? This is why. <laughs> this is the hill country. This is Bethsaida. This is what it looked like almost all times. So, oh, did Mark goof? He's making this up years later, and he's developing this mythology, and he missed out on this detail because he wasn't there. He was somewhere else and made it up. Look at John 6, verse 4. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? The mention of green grass is unusual for the arid region, but it makes sense during Passover, which is in spring when grass would be green due to increased rainfall this subtle seasonal detail in mark aligns with the timing given in john providing a coherent context for these events again this is you john to john to uh to luke yeah to luke vastly different time frame wise john's all the way in the 90s so is he sitting down and just they couldn't have planned for each other to add these details in Right? They couldn't have counted, hey, I'm counting on him to write this in the future. Right? They couldn't have counted on that. It's just independent testimony. Mark could not have possibly, I'm sorry, yeah, Mark. Mark could not have possibly known that John would include this detail. So which is more likely, considering the totality of the evidence? All these different authors across different times plan to include little details to corroborate a made-up story that they would later be killed for. Tons of them. Or... These details validate each other simply because these were real events witnessed by real people who thought it was important enough to record and to defend to the death. Which is more likely? There is good evidence for the claims of the Bible. They are extraordinary, yes, I fully acknowledge that. But the evidence, if you're a logical person, the evidence lends itself to being factual accounts of real events. There's just no getting around it. The question that we have to answer for ourselves is the same exact question that those who originally heard Jesus had to decide. How are you going to respond to Jesus? What's your response? Is he prophet? Is he fraud? Is he a liar? Is he a sham? Is he the king? Is he the Messiah? Is he my savior? Is he the son of God? These are questions that we have to answer for ourselves. In John 6, 67, the crowd turns away but Jesus says it's just too much. It's too much. They don't like it. Perhaps you've felt that way before. But they all turn away, and Jesus turns to his disciples. And so Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Where are you going to go? If you don't accept Jesus, where are you going to go? What are you striving for? What's your hope? Are you really willing to bet that all those, all those coincidences are just 
coincidences, a whole bunch of them, you know, one or two coincidences I can get behind, uh, just an accident, but a whole slew of them with a whole bunch of outside testimony and corroboration and historians outside, not influenced by Christianity, recorded the same things. Yeah, that's not a coincidence. That is God providing enough for us to have faith and to respond to King Jesus, to have him be our Savior, to accept him, to be his disciple, to die to ourselves, to repent and believe the gospel that God reigns and let him reign in your life, that you truly let him reign over your desires, your money, your attitudes, how you react, your vengeance. And we do that by dying to ourselves in baptism, washing away our sins and raised up a new creature. If you would like to become a disciple, we ask that you come forward as we